And the way we do it is we have a meeting once a month and we typically invite two to three companies to come in and pitch. Uh, but before they come in and pitch, there's through our network, we'll receive the information on the company. We'll have initial phone calls with them. We'll start to do a little bit of initial due diligence if they've gotten to that point. And then when we kind of feel like it might be a good fit and something that's investable for us, we invite them to, to come in and pitch to the limited partners. After that meeting, then we take a uh, an informal vote. And if we have, you know, kind of majority in favor of moving forward, then we continue with due diligence. You just heard David Higdon. David Higdon's focus is investment strategy, deal flow, venture portfolio support, fundraising, and client relation. He is also the co-founder of Quibitech, the first company to commercialize a new quantum optic cybersecurity solution. David served as president of Ellis Energy Investments for eight years, where he guided numerous companies through the investment growth and exit process. David was the co-founder and managing partner of the Bakersfield Jam, leading the day-to-day operations from startup to exit to the Phoenix Suns. In today's show, we discussed how entrepreneurs can apply for funding. Later in the show, we talk about how to be an investor in the KVG Fund, And be sure to stay tuned to hear the rapid fire questions and answers from David. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast, the show where your local professionals sit down with an array of guests to hear their story and impart some wisdom for both business and life improving skills. This is your place to hear business and community leaders discuss relevant topics that matter to you. And welcome to Our Two Cents. This is Troy Burton. I'll be your host today for the show. I appreciate everybody joining in. Before we get started on a uh, pretty unique guest, an old friend of mine, a high school buddy that we used to run around together. Look forward to uh, engaging with David and interviewing him in his uh, latest ventures. But uh, before we get started, we encourage everyone to go to our webpage. That's how you communicate with us, see our past episodes. Of course, we're on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And the new edition is YouTube. And we are on all the streaming platforms. David, we're happy to have you joining us today. But uh, before we get started, I want to ask you, when was Kern Venture Group founded? Thank you, Troy. And I'm happy to be here and uh, look forward to to talking a little bit more about uh, Kern Venture Group. We actually started forming Kern Venture Group back in about the middle of 2018 and went out into the community and and met with some folks that were kind of like-minded about why venture capital is important to a community and uh, began the process of, of forming what ultimately became Kern Venture Group and our first fund and started investing in startups in early 2019. To date, we've made uh, a total of 27 investments. 27 investments. And who is the uh, responsible for this brainchild? Was it you and uh, some partners, or was there a group of you? Or Yeah, so there was a, a group of folks, and, and this is something that's been of interest to me for a long time, and I've always wondered why a community like uh, Kern County and, and Bakersfield didn't have an active uh, either angel group or in, in investor club or small fund that would help entrepreneurs when they are looking to uh, to raise capital. And so kind of simultaneously be- between myself and co-founder uh, John Paul Lake, there was also another group of, of folks that had gone and, and looked at um, an angel group in Fresno. Okay. And um, that was led by, his name escapes me now, the gentleman from uh, Mid-State Development, Keith uh, Mid-State Development Bank. Anyway, his, his name will come to me in a second. And there was a group that had gone up and, and sat in, in Fresno and kind of looked at how their process was. It was a uh, kind of a just all kind of came together at the same time of kind of comparing notes and what we were looking to start. And some of the folks that had gone up to Fresno started having conversations with JP and I about what would be good for Bakersfield. And that's kind of all how this came together. And, and most of those folks are our general partners who have a real mind for the community and, and, okay. and giving back and have been successful here. David, explain to me what a angel group is. So an, an angel group would be something like uh, the largest in the nation would be something, a group called Tech Coast Angels, and they're okay. headquartered down in, in, in Los Angeles. And if a, a company was interested in, in receiving funding, they would go and apply through their website or through their network. That uh, company would be invited in and kind of like Shark Tank, right? So each, each individual investor comes in, listens to the presentation or the, or the pitch, and after that that pitch, if, if the investor has an interest in it, 
then it's up to them to go and put a deal together with the uh, the company. So each person is writing their own individual check in that investment round. Got whereas it. Kern Venture Group is a fund, we come in with just one check. It's not done individually. It's just done through the entire fund. So it's multiple investors commingled, and then you cut one check. One check. So, so everyone's in at a certain percentage. Right. And so that's kind of we thought would be the easier process here, um, just because, you know, you kind of lose that momentum once the entrepreneur comes in, gives their presentation, everybody, you know, gets excited for the evening and then yeah. everybody leaves. And then, you know, nobody invests a check, you know, 60 days, the entrepreneur is <laughs> still coming back and saying, hey, what happened? Did Shark Tank have anything to do with this? I don't remember when Shark Tank happened. And, you know, I really enjoy that show. Yeah. But I also know it's reality TV and some yeah. of it could be scripted because, you know, there's a lot of conflict between the bidders, if you will. So and I would say we're, we're like Shark Tank, but it's completely nicer, right? It's, uh, <laughs> there's no, we, you know, we- No Hollywood. Entrepreneur comes in and, and pitches, right? It's, it's, it's all done to make sure that they receive something from it, whether we provide them with, uh, with funding or feedback. Yeah. We want it to be a positive experience. So reality TV is completely different than actually when we have entrepreneurs come in and, and actually pitch their idea. It's, uh, it's informational. Uh, most of the folks that are in the room are excited to learn something new. You know, they, they might come from industry like like ag or, or oil or, or real estate. And to, to really see what's happening in, in the world is, is kind of the benefit for them. The entrepreneur hopefully walks away with a check or some advice. Is there a lot of people doing these programs? I know Bakersfield may not be a bunch, but you know, I have lived here my whole life and do business with several people through the Valley. And I've seen several businesses get gobbled up, mostly from private equity firms, mm -hmm. which, which is a little different. So can you expand the difference between private equity and of course of venture capitalist? Yeah. So I think in, in relation to private equity, those are groups that are, are similar to a fund. They, they've got a pool of money that they've raised. There's usually some sort of a central thesis around, but what they're looking to invest in, and they're either looking to take a controlling stake or acquire the, the business in whole. And they're usually looking to operate it, right? So they, they're looking usually for businesses that are well-established, whereas venture capital is looking for providing that necessary company for a company to scale, where a private equity firm might be interested in acquiring it down the road, right? So venture capital is kind of the, the first stage, private equity is kind of maybe either the middle to end stage. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about KVG. And so how do you evaluate an investment before you sit down and decide that you want to participate in backing? So there's a lot of work that goes into kind of selecting companies to come in and, and meet with our limited partners. And, and the way we do it is we have a meeting once a month and we typically invite two to three companies to come in and pitch. Uh, but before they come in and pitch, there's through our network, we'll receive the information on the company. We'll have initial phone calls with them. We'll start to do a little bit of initial due diligence if they've gotten to that point. And then when we kind of feel like it might be a good fit and something that's investable for us, we invite them to, to come in and pitch to the limited partners. After that meeting, then we take a uh, an informal vote. And if we have, you know, kind of majority in favor of moving forward, then we continue with due diligence. There's a lot of times where things then really kind of make those decisions on whether or not to move kind of on the back half of the, the due diligence. And when you do decide as a voting census to fund or invest, is everyone in or do they have the option uh, to back out. And yeah, say, every, that every, one's not for me. everybody's in. And um, so the way a fund is structured is the um, the general partners oversee the operation of the fund. So it's, it's ultimately the general partners making a final decision. Okay. And we typically, before we actually make an investment, so JP and I as the managing partners, we actually go back and we, we treat our the general partners as our board. Yes. So before we, we make an investment, we, we go back and say, we've completed our due diligence we think that we should invest X amount of dollars and then we seek uh, approval from the board before we make an investment. And you mentioned most of these are startups a little different than mm -hmm. your private equity firms out there. And I believe it's got to be more than an idea. I mean, you have to have a business plan. I think you got to know the market. Do you have to have a proven product and do you have to have sales? I mean, you know, going back to Shark Tank, these yeah. are things that are, of course, the evaluation is always based upon. What is the criteria that you look at? So we're definitely looking for, for companies that have a proven product. They have customer validation there's a good team around them, right? So it's not just a founder by himself, but he's been able to convince other people to either give him money, yes. friends and family around is yes. usually what that's called. That's true. Or they've they've got, um, and they've been able to convince like-minded professionals, you know, who can help them scale a company, right? That's right. the one thing that you 
you, you definitely need to have is, is, is a solid team. Sure. Um, or the company's going to have a really difficult time kind of making it from level to level and scaling. So we have invested in companies that are more in the uh, the concept phase. Um, I, I would say that one of our local investments that we early on that we invested in that's doing really well is a company when they came in and met with us had a formulation for a product. They had um, some ideas. They had some IP but we had a father and a son who were really well-known, well, the father, a really well-known food scientist and um, had successfully built products for other companies. He had put together the um, Califia drink line. Yes. He did all of the uh, salad dressings for Lighthouse dressing. Right. A lot of work with McDonald's and Starbucks. And so had wanted to go out instead of doing it for other people, wanted to do it for himself. And so when we met with them, they came in and uh, was was a concept, had IP, and we wrote the first check to get them started. And uh, that was kind of their seed funding to kind of start formulating a business, getting some packaging, getting some marketing, using local resources to help them do that. And they created a brand. Subsequent to that, we led what we called a series seed round where we kind of got them their next level of funding. That equated to be about $750,000 in total funding. And that's where we were able to start bringing in investor dollars from outside of the area. We led their series seed round and then brought in additional investors from outside of the area to complete kind of the the full $750,000 raise. Perfect. So let's talk portfolio. Do you guys specialize in certain niches? Like, okay, we're big in maybe technology and ag or pharmaceutical mm-hmm. or health products or whatever it is, but we don't know anything about that. Do you, are you guys diverse? And if you are, how do you evaluate products? I'm assuming that you have people with some type of a specialty or expertise in those arenas so you guys can make solid financial decisions to invest. Yeah, we say we're industry agnostic, so we don't have a specialized area that we concentrate on. Although ag tech would would certainly be something that we look at more often than not if we can. You know, we've we've looked at oil and gas technologies as as well. There's not as prevalent as, as the ag tech sector. But yeah, no, we what we do is we look for all opportunities that we think have the potential to be a successful business. And uh, we think that that's the best option for our investors because it gives us the most amount of deal flow. And by deal flow, I mean anything that's coming inbound into the office, whether it's through our our website or it's a referral or it's a syndicated um, raise that another group brings to our attention. We look at everything that has what we think, first of all, kind of a, a benefit to the region in some way. But Behind that, something that we believe can, within a couple of years, could get to at least $10 million in revenue. That's that's kind of what we're looking for. That's your goal. So I know this could be a silly question, but there's listeners out there that are listening, and, and I would be one of them, and says, well, why would I go to a Kern Venture Group uh, rather than a bank? And I kind of know the answer, but go ahead and tell me. I know the banking process is a little diff- more difficult. Yeah especially when it's more of a startup or an idea uh, without collateral. So maybe I just... Yeah, it's the it's the reason why these groups are important, whether it's an angel group or if it's a, a, a VC fund like Kern Venture Group. Typically, a, a bank is not going to loan money to um, uh, an early stage company. Um, they may, after there's you know some, some revenue coming in, they, they, they might actually... Um, loan, but then you've got to put up collateral and you may not have a house. You may not have anything to back up that loan with. Um, so whereas a fund like current venture group, really, we're just, we're taking equity. Um, we're not looking to take controlling stakes. That That's not how this is set up to be. It's growth capital to help you ultimately get to an exit, right? So in, in traditional fundraising or, or the VC world, there, there's multiple stages. Um, so you're going to continue. We always say that when you come in, the, the, the job of the founder is to generate revenue and continue to raise money because th- you do those things all the way until you get to an exit. Sure. Now I might get, be getting a little personal, but I know every deal's different. The way the amount that, that maybe the investment is, the percentage of equity that you may take. How about a uh, revolving um, residual, like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
Like like a royalty? Royalty, thank you. Yeah. Because I know, again, back to Shark Tank, this is kind of where mm-hmm. a lot of us kind of got the education about this type of program. Uh, royalties on the front end. Are all those scenarios and in, in different investment options? Yeah, it's a great thing, like, in, in business and in, in investing. Like, um, that's the great thing about business, right? You can create whatever you want to create. You can structure anything the way you want to structure it. So everything's kind of an open opportunity, especially for the, the groups that's leading the investment round. And so... Traditionally, you see a lead investor, and then that's kind of the the group that kind of backfills all that is is the syndicated folks that come in. So the lead deal or the lead group typically set the terms, and then everybody invests kind of what those those terms have been set. So if the lead investor had a royalty structure that they wanted to put in place, then traditionally everybody coming into the round would take advantage of the same provisions that the lead investor put in place. And Dave, does your firm ever part ways and say, okay, our exit strategy is 15 years, you're up and running, we've got our money back, we've made profits, rock on? I mean, or are you on the, or, or, I don't want to say you're on the hook, but are, do you have uh, involvement throughout unless you want to sell out? I mean, or, yeah, or so usually structured? We, so we're always looking expire. for companies that we invest in that have an an exit in mind, right? Because we have limited partners who've invested in the fund and they need their capital back sure. plus. And so if you had somebody that was interested in creating a legacy business for themselves, right? They want to do this for the 20 next 20 years. It's right. a husband and wife team, or, you know, it's a family business. That's probably not the right investment for current venture group or for a VC, because at the end of the day, we have to have an exit in mind. And traditionally, everybody that we are investing in has a timeline set up. And that usual timeline is somewhere between five and seven years. So our first fund had a, uh, a life of seven years with three one-year options to carry it through to, okay. to exit. And then fund two, had we started off with just a 10-year um, lifespan. Okay. So ultimately, you know, this, this ties up your capital for, you know, at least a period of, of 10 years. And so, you know, the, the risk tolerance for some people that that might not be attractive, especially if you've got an estate, you might be older, you know, you're in, you know, you don't want your estate to have to worry about, you know, a 10 year timeline. So, you know, those, those are things that are taken into account when, when somebody invests in, in a fund, but we're always looking for the entrepreneur or the founder of the company to have a goal of who they might sell to when they get to a certain stage of the company. Perfect. So I went on your webpage, did a little research, and I've seen a lot of companies that I'm familiar with here in the Central Valley. And in my opinion, I'm looking at some of these big firms, they're ag, uh, it's no secret, but I've seen Sonos on there. I've seen uh, MindBody, uh, which I believe is a uh, beauty salon, spa, gym uh, software program, if I'm not mistaken. And then Grimway and Bolthouse. And, And my first thought was these folks have cash. Why would they come to you? Yeah. They're, and they're not coming to us. Maybe that, that's just kind of a, a, maybe it just kind of read wrong. But what we're okay. saying is, is that there's a lot of companies in the central Valley have, who have gone on and, and scaled to, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, billion Got dollars it. in exit. And that the central Valley is, is rich in history of entrepreneurs starting really successful companies. If they can do it, you know, other people can do it. And you just need an idea and access to capital. We want to see more of, of the Bolt Houses and, and, and Grimways and, and Sonos and Mind Bodies. And a lot of those folks in, in, in those companies over at the Central Coast and in Santa Barbara, you know, they've gone on now to invest in the, the next generation of, of founders who are starting things. And so that's what we want to we want to do that here. We want to replicate that same mindset of giving back and helping the next generation of entrepreneur. It, it also, you know, it's, it's also a great way to potentially make money, right? If you invest sure. in the right companies. And sure. So that's why a lot of founders who have really successful exits end up doing angel investing or they actually invest in funds because it was those funds who helped them kind of scale and and grow and get them to a position where they were able to have a a large exit. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely I, I understand what your your point was now regarding those names. Uh you know, I have a little Grimway story. I'm a Quiama boy. You know me from Taft. Yep. So I moved from Quiama to the big city of Taft. <laughs> Rod and Bob Grimm started their carrot program in Cuyama and on a roadside farmer's market that's kind of on a, in an old Model T pickup truck. And if you ever go out to their facility in Arvin, you'll see pictures of them on this roadside. And of course, you see them today. They're the largest producer of carrots in the world. So mm-hmm. uh, quite a accomplishment. And, and I get your point, you know, a little seed money can really make a difference in people's future. Yeah. And it's really just for entrepreneurs around here to believe in themselves that you can create these world-class billion dollar companies. And it's one thing to have the idea and then 
you, you need to have the necessary capital to help. And, and that's really what Kern Venture Group is here for, is we want this to be something for the community that's ongoing, that's here for a long time, that uh, is here past JP and myself, right? So we can we have leadership that comes in and there's this foundation that, you know, this is a large fund and it, it helps entrepreneurs who always have ideas and need access to capital. I noticed on your webpage, you have two different funds, a 2018 fund and a 2020 fund. And I'm just assuming that 2018 is closed and fully invested. 2018 is uh, closed. We made our last investment in December of 2021 out of fund one and uh, closed fund two in, I believe it was May of 2022. And so investing out of the second fund. So I'm, I'm guessing that 2018 folks may not be in 2020, but could perhaps if they have capital to continue investing, but so, maybe their time horizon has came to an end and they're going, okay, I'm good and I'm done. Like you said, maybe retirement's in their future. 90% of folks who invested in fund one invested in fund two. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's a proven and, model then. That's, well, a good, that's, no. <laughs> that's pretty good retention. I like to say it's, it's, it's not proven yet. Really, what makes this a proven model is when we start to have exits, right? And people yes. start to see a return on their investment. Yeah. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to provide that to anyone yet. But what those folks who've invested in Fund One and Fund Two are doing, they understand how important this is to a community and why you need to have venture capital available to startups um, and it provides jobs and there's a lot of studies that have been done that Kern County creates a lot of businesses but we don't do a good job of helping them be successful we, we're not helping them sustain past kind of that first and second year so you know ultimately you need to have capital to grow and, and to scale a business and it's really hard to go to the bank or, or get an SBA loan and, and do those types of things and so the folks who have invested in fund one and fund two are really doing this for the community now, they all want to make money, so they're, sure. they're, not, they're not wanting to take a loss. Yeah. And that's where the pressure come for, for JP and myself is to, <laughs> over time, get everybody their initial investment back and, you know, uh, a multiple on their original um, investment. So that, that's our goal, and that's what we work hard to do. But the, the folks who have come in early are, are really good partners and, and believe in what we're trying to do and believe in the community that we have good entrepreneurs here and that we need to have access to, to capital. Are you willing to sh- uh, share how much uh, your first fund, is the value of that total fund is? Yeah, so the, the first fund um, is very small, two and a quarter million dollars, okay. right? And, um, you know. How many people you think's in? Uh, just under 20. Okay. Uh, total. And then fund two is six and a half million. Okay. In total capital. And still bringing people in if interested? No. The, the fund is actually, yeah, closed. Okay. Um, so the next opportunity to invest would be in our third fund. All right. Um, we probably won't start raising money for that until, you know, a year from now. But uh, if somebody had an interest in coming alongside, there, there's certain things that we can we can do. There's things that are called SPVs, which are special purpose vehicles. And uh, investors can al- invest alongside of Kern Venture Group as long as they're accredited. There are some unique things that people can do if they, um, if they wanted to get involved prior to the, the next fund. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So I know that you have some community involvement as well, because it's not just about funding, but like you said, giving someone feedback, maybe even telling them some of the steps that they need to do, like a great legal team behind them or accounting team or marketing team or whatever that may Mm -hmm. be. And I know that I've seen some stuff about Bitwise, which is a fairly new company in Bakersfield. Why don't Mm -hmm. you expand on what that program's about and uh, your network with them? Yeah. So Bitwise has uh, multiple locations in, in California. So their, their uh, headquarters is in, in Fresno. Their, I think their second location was actually here in Bakersfield. Mm-hmm. And they recently opened in Merced and they also have a, a, a location in Oakland. And that's another phenomenal uh, success story of, of raising capital. Um, so, you know, uh, two founders from Fresno who have, you know, just recently raised um, a Series B round of, of $50 million. That's a, that's a significant amount of money uh, for the Central Valley from um, f- for raising venture capital. So mm-hmm. they've, they've done a, a very good job in scaling, using that money now to invest in um, 10 other Bitwise locations across the U.S. And they, they specialize in investing in what they call underdog communities. So communities don't have a lot of resources set up for entrepreneurs. And um, part of what we are doing with Fund2 is we've, we've partnered with Bitwise um, to get a first look at companies that come through their Um, their cohort. So they have like an incubator where they're taking companies and uh, they spend six months with them to kind of help prepare them. 
um, and get them ready to meet with investors, um, help them hone their idea, um, provide them, you know, with, with legal assistance, help them actually formalize um, company agreements. And so our relationship with them is that we could provide them with kind of their first investment when they come through their program. Very interesting. You know, I, I knew they came to town. I think I even know some people that are actually working with them, but uh, I've never stepped foot in there. Uh, all I know, it's a really cool building downtown, Yeah, <laughs> which is, which is a plus. Yeah. But, uh, I really didn't know exactly what they were doing. I thought it was more of a, just a virtual type. Hey, I need to sit down and do some work for an hour. I think they got a couple different business models. They've got there. a couple I mean, real estate is a big portion of what yeah. they're, they're doing. They also have, they train kind of, uh, software engineers, yeah. right? So folks who are interested in coding and, and, and writing code for companies, you can come in and, and get training and, they help place you when you graduate from their program. Well, that's very cool. I've seen an article. I don't recall where it came from. I'm sure it was a resource that you provided probably from your page again. And it says, uh, why are startups flocking to our town? Talk a little bit about that because I don't know that everyone realizes that. And uh, tell me a little bit about what you know about that. So um, we're, we're, we're very economical. Okay. So for, for housing, for instance, if, you have, if you're starting a company in, in Silicon Valley, which is where <laughs> most all the venture capital money is, right? That's kind of like the, the hub of, yes. you know, if you want to start up, you want to be the next Facebook, you go to right. Sand Hill Road and you, you go out and you, you raise money. But to put a team together of 50 people or 100 people, I mean, where are you going to house money. everybody, right? If you're not able to pay them $200,000 a year. Basically, Bakersfield is attractive from the ability that you can – be affordable. Your, your capital goes a lot further here um, than it goes in some of these other markets. And so you've got a lot of people that are interested in the area. The folks over in, in San Luis Obispo and Pismo, or not Pismo, but Paso Robles are, are doing a good job of collectively trying to attract folks from the Bay Area to start their companies there. Bakersfield, we're starting to do that as well. And so when your, your dollars just go further in, in, in cities like Bakersfield, because raising money is tough. And um, you don't, as an entrepreneur, you don't want to have to do that often in between each round just because it, it's a long process. Sure. A lot of rejection. And it also it takes um, your focus off what you're your trying to do away from what you're doing. So if you had a million dollars in funding, that runway in Bakersfield probably gets you an extra six or eight months compared to where it might get you in another market. Got you. Got you. While we're talking about that, I believe that you have some affiliations with some of the colleges that you're working with them. Talk about those colleges and, and what kind of products you're seeing come out of those colleges, if you will. I believe Cal State Bakersfield is obviously on the list, and I know Cal Poly San Luis is on the list, and I think there was um, um, another one, but um, go ahead and expand on that. Yeah, so we're just getting started with Cal State Bakersfield and, and Bakersfield College and, and kind of helping. Uh, that's where we're JP Lake spends a lot of his time, my, my co-founder at Current Venture Group, is is really kind of helping to put together programs for um, students that are coming through um, Cal State and, and through Bakersfield College. We've seen a couple of companies, um, no, no companies that have come through um, our local university or college that we've invested in yet, but um, programs like Cal Poly over in San Luis Obispo, they have taken an approach of kind of putting together all the pieces uh, for folks who are in school, who have an idea for a business, um, and helping them be trained for when they graduate, that they have an, a, a company that they can, they can run. And they actually have um, students who are actually receiving funding while they're still in, in college. I mean, we, we looked at a company very recently where um, we, we had a, a, the, the person who had a company was a senior and he stressed out because he was carrying a, <laughs> a, a monthly nut of $40,000 a month and trying to finish his degree. Wow. And so it's just, you know, that that's one case where they've had other folks that, you know, come through and when they graduate, they've got everything in place. They've got a product. Um, the, the universities help them, um, you know, show it off around the world, maybe help them with manufacturing support, maybe help them start to ramp up their sales process and they're, they've already received some funding. And so when they get through that, they, they've got a viable company and we work with um, that program um, and we've actually invested in five companies that have, have come through um, the Cal Poly um, Hot House program. It's, it's something that we aspire to do here locally and, and over time have kind of that pipeline of folks that come through uh, college 
um, university or or not. They could come through Bitwise or they could, you know, have an, an idea, but they've kind of got all the pieces in place because there's some resources now in the community that help them prepare. And so when they're ready to to raise money, we have that pipeline of P- and they know where to go. OK, hey, we know that current venture groups here. We know that they can help us raise money locally. They also know that we they can help us raise money outside of the area as well. That's what Cal Poly's done. UC Irvine does a really great job as well. They have a, a, um, a facility called The Cove. They do a lot more in the community outside of just UC Irvine, but they also have, it's open for entrepreneurs outside of the community to come in and have access to resources. We're starting to do quite a bit more with UC Riverside, and they have programs in place, and we're starting to look at a lot of startups that have come through the UC Riverside program. Dave, I'm going out on the limb, but I'm kind of backtracking a little bit of the last conversation we had about people coming to Bakersfield. Now, we're talking job market and, of course, entrepreneurship. Do you feel like the bigger cities are much more competitive and less available to get programs than maybe a Bakersfield market? Well, I mean, this is something that I shared with one of our general partners. And if you looked at our website, you could probably see who it was. But there's a lot of biotech fundraising uh, happening in Los Angeles right now. A a lot of money flowing into biotech. And they don't have the lab space to facilitate all these startups that need a place to go. We have a lot of area here that, you know, if we if we we're able to build a, a biotech um, research center that we could start to attract probably a lot of uh, startups from the Bay Area and from Southern California. And, you know, just it's not it's just through not having the space to do it. Right. So maybe we can partner with some of those groups um, in the Bay Area and, and, and also down in L.A. Um, not that we're saying that, you know, hey, this is the better place to be, but you got to have a place to go and, sure. and actually build a company. And uh, I think Bakersfield could be very attractive for the development that, that's going to take place in biotech over the next decade. You know, Bakersfield could could be a, a research center and could be a real partner for the startup community down there. Sure, I see that. Now I'm going to go back to where we were and talk about JP and Cal State Bakersfield. Are these programs that he is influencing or involved in, are these brand new programs like brick and mortar? We need to build labs and facilities and so on. Not not so much that I, they, they have the facilities and I wish I knew better about what JP was doing, but there's a big fundraising campaign that, yep. that's taking place that a lot of that uh, is, is going to, but, you know, kind of there's, there are some initiatives that are in place and, and JP's, you know, certainly working with Cal State to build a much more robust program. And then there was something that caught my eye that I thought was very unique and maybe somewhat strange to me because I'm just not familiar with it. But I noticed that Valley Strong Bank is an investor into your fund. They are. They're actually our largest investor in fund too. And they they actually have a venture arm that, that we weren't aware of, but they've been investing in, in startups, mostly in the fintech space um, okay. for a number of years. And they have a real passion about helping small businesses in the Central Valley and and see this as a, as a way that they can become not just known as kind of the, the teacher's credit union, which you know, we've Used all to known for a long time, but that they also supply many services and, and opportunities for, for businesses and uh, want to help entrepreneurs and, and want to be involved early in the process. It's, it's one of the best things that lawyers like to do is to get to know startups really early in the process because you build that relationship early and you typically have that person for that company for a long time. Right. And so Valley Strong and Nick Ambrosini there, the, the president and CEO, sees the real value in, in helping establish relationships early and, and be there as a support to help businesses. Very, very cool, Dave. Um, You know, I told you before the show started that our podcast is really about entrepreneurship. And obviously, that's really your goal of funding people with great ideas and putting it, you know, traction on the pavement with some funding resources. But you obviously are an entrepreneur. We went to high school together. And I know you have quite the portfolio. You've been around the community just like me forever. And I believe you're still the co founder of uh, tell me if I'm saying this wrong, but it's a Quibi tech. Yeah, Cubatech. Cubatech. What is that? So that is a uh, yeah, and you're going to get way out of it's a <laughs> it's a technical. It, it's yeah, I tried above to, my pay grade, I, but basically what it is is it's um, being able to prevent when when ultimately quantum computers 
um, are um, more available, uh, whether we don't actually have a real working quantum computer yet, um, but we're getting close. But, okay. you know, those are, that's a million times faster than our, our, our normal computer capacity, right? So passwords and encryption and all those things go out the window very quickly. And so the, uh, the, the co-founder, Dr. Earl, came from the, uh, the National Lab in, in Tennessee, and he had this great idea of being able to help secure the electrical grid from an impending cyber attack from a quantum computer. Right. And so that's what uh, that company is working towards. And they've been working closely with uh, um, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, got great utility partners, and they are, are trying to build this infrastructure that will, will keep us all safe mm-hmm. if, if we are ever hit by uh, a quantum computing uh, attack that's trying to shut down the electrical grid. Gotcha. And looking back at some of your other experiences, you were the president of Ellis Energy Investments for about eight years. I think probably, no, I've seen you since then, but uh, you were also the managing partner of the Bakersfield Jam. So I know you have a passion for sports. I have a huge passion for sports. That was probably one of the uh, the funnest um, businesses <laughs> and, and the most frustrating um, that I've ever been involved in. Yep. And uh helped uh, bring uh, an NBA minor league franchise to Bakersfield back in, in 2006, managed the day-to-day operations of, of the team until we sold it to the Phoenix Suns. And then the Phoenix Suns relocated it to Prescott Valley so that it would be closer to uh, to their parent organization. So it was a good experience. I got you, buddy. Um, so if someone's listening and they're an entrepreneur and they got a great idea and they would really like to talk to you and get in front of your panel of investors and say, what do you guys think? Uh, what's the best way for that to happen? Just to uh, send me an email at david at K-E-R-N-V-G uh, dot com. So david at Kern VG, like venture group dot com. And that's uh, you'll uh, we'll definitely we, we look at every opportunity that comes in and uh, would be happy to talk with any local entrepreneur that's got an idea and is, is looking for funding. We'll have all David's contact information in the show notes of the podcast as well. And maybe one thing I, I could say yeah. is um, so out of fund two, our uh, excuse me, our minimum investment is a hundred thousand, okay, and our our maximum is five hundred. So the average check size out of our second fund is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I didn't ask you this: is there a limit of what you will actually fund into a option? Yeah, so the the max that we've kind of set for our own internal guidelines, and it's not binding, but we we've set a max of five hundred, and uh, typically to to reach that level, it would be a company that we're probably in, it would be investing in a period of time, and that their headquarters is in Kern County. So okay. we we try to save the most amount of investment for local companies that are headquartered here. So out of fund one, we had two companies that kind of fit that criteria where we, our max out of fund one was $225,000. And we invested in, in two companies, Millet, which I spoke about earlier, the plant-based food company, and then Vinergy, both of those companies headquartered here, local founders. And uh, we invested $225,000 in both of those companies. Both of those companies have now gone on to raise subsequent funding, both in about the two and a half million dollar range okay. of total funding. It must be fun to sit and watch this all uh, take place. So what is the vision of uh, KVG? I mean, are you going to continue to open funds moving forward or do you have a goal that you're going to hit and, and call it good or what's the, what's the plan? Yeah, no, like I, I mentioned, the goal would be really two things. Number one, we, we've got to return profit sure. to our, our shareholders, right? That's the number one thing that we, we want to accomplish. The, the second thing is we want to be a viable source of capital for the long term for, for Kern County. And as, as people begin to come up with ideas, you know, e- even folks who, who, who work in, in a daily basis in, in, in a particular sector that we have here, you know, folks might come up with something that the industry needs that they've been, you know, maybe they've been working in ag for 30 years and they've got an idea, but they don't know how to bring it to market. I mean, we've, we've got to be able to help people with ideas um, be able to, to bring their, their ideas to, to market and, and to help the industry, right? I mean, we, we need to support local oil, local ag, and help them with maybe new technology or, or new products or, th- or things that haven't been thought about. And part of what we try to do with Current Venture Group, whether we invest or not, is even if we come across a company that has application for a business here, 
we, we try to make introductions. So if we see a, an, an ag company or an ag tech company that maybe we can't invest in because they're too far down the road, okay. but maybe they just need an introduction or we know that there's growers here that are looking at a particular, you know, we, we know that costs are high and this might help them save money. We, we try to make those introductions as well. And whether they're, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but when we do have companies that come here, if we don't have a particular expertise, we, we try to invite folks from the community. Yep or outside of the community that can help us make a decision or help us evaluate something. Dave, we have a little bit of fun with our guests, and uh, you would be no different. So I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions and see how you handle this. So okay. uh, who was uh, your biggest mentor? My parents. It makes me choke up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've, they've just always been supportive of me, always um, believed in kind of me as a, as a business person and entrepreneur, always told me that, hey, Whatever you set your mind to, you you can achieve and you can be successful. So certainly they don't have business backgrounds, but uh, always from a very early stage, uh, my parents believed in me, always told me I could be successful. And I try to instill that in, in my kids, right? Just whatever you want to do in life, don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do it. You know, my son wants to play in the NBA. I certainly am not passing down any great genetics, but, uh, you know, he should, he should aspire to, uh, to, to make it to the NBA and anybody that's got an idea for a, a, a business and, you know, if you, you should surround yourself with people who are telling you, yeah, that's a great idea. You should be able to go out and do it and, and, and to, to believe in yourself to get it done. Yeah. I tell you, it uh, really same as me starts with the parents and, uh, come from a complete different background, but, you know, and I've had my ups and downs in life, like we all have and the support there is never waved around you know yeah. it's just been solid i agree with that hey uh, what was your biggest failure and what did you learn from it the so biggest failure was probably um the, the bakersfield jam in in the very beginning we we got involved with a uh, a business that um my, myself and, and business partner stan ellis you know we we didn't know anything about professional basketball and um we thought it was a good idea for the community and, and yeah. thought it would be fun right who doesn't want to have a, a basketball yeah. team but it was a lot of hard work. Um, we got a lot of bad advice um, early on in the process from supposed experts in, in this space. <laughs> and we, we literally made uh, every mistake that you can make in owning a minor league sports team. And we, we made them all. We could write a book about what not to do. Um, but, you know, through, um, you know, kind of just basically having to find a way to, to turn it around, um, developed a, a business model that we found a way to make it work, right? We, we, we had a small arena um, in, uh, in Oildale. Yep. And um, you, you would have Scottie Pippen playing, you know, coming to, to watch basketball. Um, and we had, you know, guys who were making, you know, millions of dollars a year playing in Oildale. And so we, we created a business model that, that made sense. So what was one of probably my biggest failures also turned out to be one of my greatest successes was, you know, by being able to stick with something and just because it didn't work one way, trying to figure out another way to make it work. I, I, th- I think that's uh, the biggest lesson I've learned is don't, don't stop. You might hit a wall, but there's always a way to find a way around it. I do agree. I've always said if you're not failing, you're probably not doing anything. So it's stepping stones of life. What's a common myth about your job in your field of expertise? Um, in relation to, 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 to venture capital, I, I would say that um, it, it's, it's easy to, to raise money. Um, I, I think that there's, you know, we, we always read things in, in, in magazines and in newspapers and you see all the success stories of, you know, folks who go out and raise, you know, millions of dollars to start a company. And um, it, it's a lot of hard work. And uh, no, certainly there's those outliers where you walk in and yep. somebody writes you a million dollar check, right? And that's how you, you make a movie and then everybody wants to do that. <laughs> but it, it's, it's not easy. And um, there, you get told no a lot more than probably what you would expect. It's, it's probably related to like show business, right? You always say that, you know, that's, that's, you got to be able to, to, be, to, to hear the word no. And I, I'd say that's the same for entrepreneurs is that it, it's not easy. Um, but you can raise money. There's, there's, and it doesn't have to all be from current venture group, right? You can, right. the beautiful, the one thing about COVID was it opened up the, the entire world to raising capital in a way that's never been done. And you can go through accelerator programs here in Bakersfield and the program might be based in New York or might be based in Brazil. And you can bring a company through those other programs. Um, but yeah, th- I'd say one of the biggest myths is that it's easy to, to raise money. 
Sure. We didn't really go down the COVID um, discussion much, but, you know, I was thinking about when you started this and then COVID happened and the fear factor of most people. Um, I imagine there was some concerns because we didn't know from one day to the next, you know, I'm in sales and Mm -hmm. do employee benefits and my employers were laying off 50, 60, 70, 80%, some, some leaving, some shutting down, whatever early retirement. And it was pretty scary time. So if, uh, you came to me and says, Hey, would you like to invest in the fund? I would probably go, you know, I'm not too secure where I'm sitting. So I imagine it was pretty volatile mentally, uh, during those times. So obviously yeah. you've overcame it. Uh, I think you guys are doing great. We have David Higdon, co-managing partner of Kern Venture Group. David, I appreciate you as a friend and uh, what you're providing to the community and your service. Thank you for joining us today on our two cents podcast. Thank you. It's my pleasure. This show has been brought to you by the law office of Kyle Jones, Troy Burton with the Lynn Company, CPA John Duffield, Scott Hansen Real Estate Lender, Broker and Investor, Dave Plivlich, President and CEO of the Marcom Group and MarcomBranding.com, and Amanda DiGiacomo, President of Atlas Financial Solutions. You've been listening to the Our Two Cents Podcast. Check out the show notes for links and more information about the show. Also visit our website at OurTwoCentsPodcast.com or catch us on Instagram at Our Two Cents Podcasts. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share with others. 